Where we are, I think, this year is, is in a position where the, the legislative proposals we're looking at, as well as the you know, level of debate and, um, and, and sort of basic knowledge about the, the, uh, the substantive issues that we're debating in the Senate are far advanced from where we were last year and um, almost unrecognizable from where we started out two years ago. Uh, it's, it's been a long process, over two years now, that we've been working on this legislation, and I think it's really paid dividends in terms of trying to get a, a, a broad coalition of people in the Senate to um, develop a, an, an approach to cybersecurity that, uh, that is bipartisan, that balances uh, you know, security and industry concerns, balances um, sort of the, the cost of acting with the urgency of the threat um, and, and that balances a number of the other issues that be, we've been wrestling with. We are continuing to, to work on that uh, legislation with that approach, but I think we've made a lot of progress and I think uh, we're narrowing in on a bill that we're going to be able to bring to the floor in the next few weeks here. Um, so the timing question is easy. Senator Reid is committed to bring legislation to the floor in the first work period. Um, back in the, in the Senate, which starts next week. So I think it'll be, you know, sometime in the next three to four weeks probably when we bring legislation to the floor. The process here is really important. Um, I think because, you know, this is a really complicated set of issues and there are a number of different opinions within the Senate and outside the Senate that we're wrestling with and trying to reflect in the legislation. And we're not going to get it right with the legislation that we bring to the floor as our base bill. We're going to have to work on some things through the amendment process because, frankly, there's a number of issues out there, you know, where opinion is so divergent that we don't know what the majority of the Senate believes. Um, and I'll give you a few examples, but I think, you know, the, as many of you know, the process to this point has been one where we have tried to bring together, um, you know, anywhere from from six to eight or more committees of jurisdiction over over these issues to work together on a bipartisan basis and to, to develop language. Um, on a wide range of proposals. Uh, you know, we call it a comprehensive cybersecurity bill. It's not comprehensive. I mean, it's not going to touch on a lot of really important elements to cybersecurity because you can't do everything in one bill. But it is comprehensive in the, se in the sense that it covers a, a pretty broad waterfront in, in granting the government new authorities, in emphasizing certain areas that we would like to see more action in, in clarifying roles and responsibilities and that kind of thing. So. Um, you know, we, we've been working to develop this through a series of working groups, through a sort of iterative process of, of developing uh, legislative language and soliciting feedback both from within the Senate and from the um, broad, broader set of stakeholders, including the private sector, uh, that, that have a role to play here. And we now are circulating language on a number of different proposals that uh, I think will ultimately comprise the, the base bill that we bring to the floor, continuing to solicit input. Um, I would expect that within the next week or so, uh, optimistically, you know, there, there will be a, a, a broad bill um, that collects these different proposals now circulating and, and is introduced in, in the Senate. We'll take that and then we'll continue to solicit input. And I think once we get to the floor, this is where um, I, I think the process is, is absolutely crucial. What we hope to have is a debate that's kind of, you know, the way the, the Senate used to do business in its, in its better days, or at least the imagined better days that, that people speak of um, when they're pessimistic about the present. Uh, you know, where we really do have a legitimate um, open debate and hash some of these issues out. And I would expect amendments on a wide range of issues. I would expect amendments to strip things out that are in the bill we bring to the floor, to add things in that aren't in the bill, to tweak things, to address, you know, some major areas of legislation that, that may not end, end up in the base bill. And, you know, to be perfectly honest, I don't know what the outcome of a lot of those debates are, and it doesn't matter. I mean, at the end of the day, if we are able to have those debates and go through that amendment process, you know, whatever I think, what comes out of the Senate will be something that has uh, the majority of the Senate support, because we will have voted on, on all those issues. Um, so I, I, I think we're, we're very enthusiastic about that process. We think that's the best way to move forward on, on a set of very complex and, um, uh, you know, divisive, not in a 
contentious sense, but in a sense that they produce a lot of varying opinions, um, very complex and divisive issues, you know. So um, that'll be our process, and we will uh, expect to have a bill that um, we can we can garner the majority of the support of the, of the Senate to, to get out of the Senate and send it over to the House. And um, the House has been doing a lot of work that I think, you know, we've been encouraged to see is, is really in line with with the kind of uh, issues that we're wrestling with in terms of taking on a lot of the, the same areas of action. And, uh, you know, um, <laughs> we'll, we'll hear in a second about some of those information sharing piece in particular, I think, is, is something we've thought of as, as, as very, very important. And they've taken a, taken a leading role in fleshing out an approach there. So um, I, I think we're, we're uh, hopeful that this can be an area where we can, you know, truly work with the um, in a, in a bipartisan manner, and, and the practical reality of it is we've got to have something that's bipartisan. We have Democratic control of the Senate and Republican control of the House, and if we're going to get a bill into law, it's going to have to be one that, that both of those chambers agree to, and so that's our, our ultimate goal. Great. Thank you. Joel, you guys got a nice bill through the early process there. Can you tell us about it? Sure. Um, so um, <clears throat> the chairman uh, came to uh, his staff in, in late spring, early summer, um, and said, look, you know, we need to look at the cybersecurity issue. The chairman and members of our committee have been long been involved in cybersecurity. And the chairman said, we need to look at this issue and figure out where and how, uh, if at all, the intelligence community can contribute to improving the nation's cybersecurity. Um, and so what he tasked us with, uh, working closely with the ranking member and his staff, was to go out and talk to folks in the industry, talk to folks in the government, in the executive branch, and folks on the Hill, and try to understand where, if at all, the intelligence community, community could contribute, and if so, what role the intelligence committee should play in, um, in, in helping that process move forward. And what we realized uh, fairly quickly uh, was that the, the real key point in the cybersecurity debate for the intelligence community um, and we were very careful to sort of, you know, scope our effort down to just what our committee had uh, jurisdiction over, uh, per the chairman and the ranking member's direction. Um, and what we realized was the intelligence community has a lot of very valuable information in its hands um, that if we were able to effectively share with the private sector, it would enable the private sector to better protect itself. Uh, at the same time, uh, what we recognized was the private sector had a lot of very valuable information in its own hands about what it's, what it's on its networks. And if the private sector were better able to share within the private sector, among entities within the private sector, as well as on a voluntary basis with the government, um, that would help the private sector itself enhance its cybersecurity um, and allow the government to enhance its own cybersecurity. And so uh, what uh, we came back to the chairman and the ranking member with this information, um, and uh, they decided they wanted to uh, draft some legislation uh, to address that issue. And, um, and what we have is the bill that passed out of the House Intelligence Committee in early December um, on a 17 to 1 bipartisan vote. Um, and so, I, you know, I think we believe, uh, as, as the Intelligence Committee did, um, that we can get to bipartisan consensus um, on some of these key uh, parts of the cybersecurity uh, conundrum. Um, and in particular, what our bill does, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's 11 pages, I believe, at introduction, so very short, plain English. Um, and what it does is it authorizes the intelligence community to provide uh, both classified and unclassified cyber threat information to the private sector. Uh, directly, uh, with, in the case of classified information, to entities that have clearances and are eligible to receive uh, such information. It provides a process for providing security clearances to uh, the private sector. And then on the private sector end, what it does is it provides clear authority to the private sector to monitor their networks um, and to use uh, both the government's information as well as the private sector's own information um, to defend their networks. And also permits the private sector to share the information. Uh, and then finally, it incentivizes <coughs> Uh, the private sector to, to engage in that by providing uh, certain limited liability protections. Um, it also has uh, important uh, privacy and civil liberties protections built in, um, a number that were built into the base bill as well as a number that were adopted um, by voice vote um, in the Intelligence Committee. Um, and it also includes congressional reporting um, on some of this stuff by um, the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community. So, you know, we've tried to sort of craft, uh, the, the chairman and the ranking member have tried to craft a very narrow bill uh, stays in the State of Intelligence Committee's lane, uh, but it does something useful. It provides information to the private sector to enable it to better defend itself and provide the private sector with clear authority to engage in that defense and to share information about cyber threats. Great. Kevin? Uh, my name is Kevin Gronberg. I work uh, for the House Homeland Security uh, Committee, uh, Chairman Pierre King. 
Um, we have a bill that we've been working on that, uh, as, as introduced by uh, Chairman of the Subcommittee that handles cybersecurity, Dan Lundgren from California, and, and uh, Chairman of the Full Committee, Peter King. Um, we, much like Jamil and the, the, the Intelligence Committee, we, we uh, were a members of the, the uh, as most will, hold on, let me just back up here. As most will remember, the speaker uh, at the beginning of this Congress recognized that cybersecurity is, a, is an issue that cuts across multiple jurisdictions and, and something that Tommy has, has explained well in the Senate. Um, and it, it, for example, the, the bill from the previous Congress, the 111th Congress, the Senate, uh, that the Lederman Collins bill from the Senate was, was cut and pasted and introduced in the House and it was referred to nine different committees. <laughs> Uh, which gives nine different chairmen and different, different abilities to either <coughs> change or stop that bill uh, completely. Uh, the speaker recognized that this is a problem for such an important issue, and he, he uh, asked uh, um, uh, Mac Thornberry from Texas to head up a task force com uh, comprised of, uh, I think it was 11, no, not, nine different committees, because there were 12 and there were a couple of large members. Um, those, those nine different committees that, that had most jurisdictional claim on this issue. Um, of course, we had members uh, on, on that, that task force. Uh, we participated in that, that effort. Uh, that report came out, uh, which essentially addressed the Republican caucus's point of view of what should be uh, contained in a uh, cybersecurity bill. Uh, that was approved by the speaker and, and uh, given out to the, the chair uh, men of the committees in October. Um, with the instructions of, okay, committees, you guys are the, the, the committees of jurisdiction, go work your magic and uh, report out bills that are, fall within your jurisdiction. And so that's what, what uh, Chairman Rogers did with, with uh, the Intelligence Committee. That's what we're doing with our bill. Um, and just as the Intelligence Committee bill um, is narrowly within their jurisdiction, we, we attempted to do the same thing. Uh, our bill has a, a couple of different sections. Um, like Tommy said, clarifying the roles and responsibilities of elements of government, specifically the Department of Homeland Security, because that's where our jurisdiction lies. Um, how to improve uh, cybersecurity within critical infrastructure sectors, um, and then information sharing, much like uh, the Intelligence Committee. Um, but we took a slightly different tact on that element of, of information sharing, um, in that we focused on um, moving the uh, moving the mechanism of, of information sharing into the private sector, uh, believing that, much like the Intelligence Committee, getting timely and actionable information into the hands of the owners and operators of critical infrastructure is the most effective way of protecting those systems. Um, and creating a mechanism that uh, is um, responsive to that stakeholder group um, is important. So as uh, as such, what we did is we uh, authorized the designation of a national information sharing organization, which would at, have a board of, I believe it's, <laughs> they've been changing it, so I, I think it's 18 different, uh, different board members, four of which are representatives from um, federal government agencies that have a expertise in cybersecurity, um, and the remaining are private sector uh, representatives from various critical infrastructure as well as uh, privacy and civil liberties groups, and uh, at least one that represents a small business contingent. Um, we believe that this will ensure that um, the information sharing organization is responsive to the private sector um, and that it, it provides a certain structure for information sharing. Um, the idea is to incentivize membership within this organization, um, allow a certain uh, a certainty for that, that information that is shared. Uh, we have liability <coughs> protections on the information that is shared, but there is a, um, again, there is a structure. So it, it gives a, a clarity of roles and responsibilities. It gives a one-stop shop, so to speak, for something just happened on my networks. I believe other people might be affected to, who do I go talk to? Well, the answer is clear. You go, go, go share this with the National Information Sharing Organization. Um, that way, it also provides an element for appropriate government oversight over that information so that the right information is being shared to the right people at the right time. 
time frame gives, gives a certain amount of metrics to it. Um, so that's pretty much the content. Uh, the process is, and, and I will defer to Jamil or Mr. Goulet's uh, office if they have a little bit more information on how um, house leadership is going to move forward with this. Um, we were given instructions to go forth and, and put forth a bill. That is exactly what we we're doing. Uh, we plan on uh, marking up in subcommittee uh, February 1st. Um, and with the full committee having a markup shortly thereafter, uh, depending on the, on the schedule of the committee. As for the process, after we report this bill out to the, the whole house, um, it's a bit unclear. Um, there is a um, unsure as to whether the bills will be passed separately on the, off the floor and then attempted to uh, uh, conference with the Senate bill, or if they will be held at the House floor and combined. Uh, it's, uh, I'm, I just, I'd be speculating uh, to tell you how, how the process is going to go. But uh, I, I've been given instructions to get this bill through our committee, and that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going <laughs> to turn it over and say this is the best we can do. Ask, call me if you have any questions. So that's kind of uh, what, what our, our, expect, our expectations are at this point. Chris. Hi, I'm Chris Fine, and I'm with the National Security Staff at the White House. Um, I thought first I would just talk about process and how we see the process and sort of the process that we've had so far, uh, a little bit about our content and then, and then a little bit about timing. Uh, really, our process began um, at the invitation of the Senate leadership uh, in mid-2010. Uh, they invited us to uh, present a proposal to them. Uh, we knew there was a great deal of interest uh, in this issue on the Hill, and it's also something that we looked at uh, in the cyberspace policy review, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, at the invitation of the, the Senate leaders, uh, we worked on a proposal for about uh, nine, nine and a half months. Uh, in fact, some of the people in the room here I know were part of that. Uh, we really, we tried to make it, uh, we, we started with a clean slate and tried to develop a proposal based on the authorities that we needed. So, so what you'll find absent in our proposal are things like reorganization. Uh, there, there aren't any new structural reforms in our proposal. It's really, uh, what we try to do is focus it solely on authorities that we, we need now, uh, modernizing laws, updating laws, to be able to affect more good, be able to mitigate threats, uh, in particular threats to the critical infrastructure. Um, that increasingly is our concern in the executive branch, that uh, there are vulnerabilities in the critical infrastructure that we absolutely need to mitigate and uh, we are concerned that we do not have the current authorities to do so effectively in the future. And so you'll find that at the heart of our proposal are increasing those authorities. Authorities so that, um, for example, the Secretary of DHS can <coughs> ensure critical, critical infrastructure owners and operators are properly addressing vulnerabilities and risks. Uh, so in, in terms of that process, in, in May 2011, we delivered our proposal to the Hill uh, we've briefed about probably 50 times, and, and we've had executive branch represent, representatives uh, testify at about, at about 14 hearings. Uh, we also were able to, uh, at the invitation of the Senate leadership, participate in a series of working groups. It's notable because uh, you'll find, I think, in the House and Senate, they've both taken a, a cross-committee approach to this problem, and let me explain what I mean by that, because they've each taken sort of a different variation. Uh, the Senate leadership has stood up a series of uh, cross-committee working groups, functional working groups, to look at different areas of the legislation. Uh, they generously invited us to take part in that and represent our proposals equities, uh, which we did. Uh, the discussions were largely bipartisan, and uh, I think they were uh, quite fruitful, and I, I hope I uh, have presented uh, at least some semblance of a, at least a pathway toward a bipartisan bill, and I think that's what you're seeing in some of the drafts coming out of the Senate. Uh, on the House side, of course, the leadership of the Speaker and uh, Mr. Thornberry and his task force, again, created this roadmap, which, uh, though conceptual, uh, has now deferred to the committees, of course, uh, the implementation of those concepts. So uh, at least they, the House, as well, provided this sort of cross-jurisdictional uh, roadmap, which now we're seeing the committee chairs uh, go forward and implement. And obviously, we're very interested to see uh, how that develops and watching it very closely. I will say that, by and large, uh, the White House does agree with, with the 
House Task Force recommendations in concept. And again, we are very interested to see uh, uh, how that implementation fleshes out. So that's the process. Really for us, as I mentioned, the content is first and foremost about addressing vulnerabilities in our critical infrastructure. You know, these are the most vital of systems and assets that uh, you know, store our defense intellectual property, uh, supply our communities with power and water, uh, support our troops in the field through military command and control, that sort of thing. That, that is our prim primary concern that we want to address. Um, on the margins, of course, there are other things that we want to do. We want to give our law enforcement and prosecutors new tools to be more effective, uh, not only to deter ta attacks, but also to uh, safeguard Americans' private information. We want to give uh, DHS new authority, uh, rather clear authority, to be able to pr protect government networks essential to provide services and the operation of the government. Uh, we want to provide new personnel authorities so as a government we can grow our human capital and our capabilities, which of course is very important. Um, but let me just go back to really the content and the timing for us. So our proposal we always recognized was for us the starting point of the conversation. Uh, we've been very fortunate to be able to engage with the Congress, to be able to help, hopefully we think, shape the views and, and the way these uh, bills are going. But there are some, some absolute essential elements to legislation that we're going to need to see. And in particular, it's a way for the federal government to ensure that critical in infrastructure owners and operators are adequately addressing risks. We think the American people expect their federal government to, do, to address the risks that we all share. Uh, so we're going to be interested to see that uh, as we move forward. Um, as I mentioned, DHS authorities to be able to better protect the federal government. As many of you probably know, this is pretty well plowed ground, especially as it relates to FISMA. Um, new information sharing, of course, uh, that was in our proposal, and that's something that we look forward to uh, helping craft on a bipartisan basis. Uh, one of the important elements or essential elements for us in information sharing is ensuring that there are adequate privacy and civil liberty safeguards uh, in the bill. Uh, we need to make sure that we have affirmative safeguards in the legislation uh, so that we're not erasing uh, decades of privacy protections. Uh, and so on timing, I would just say that uh, the cyber threat is increasing in sophistication by the minute. I'm sure as many of the people in this room know. Uh, so for us, uh, tomorrow could not be too soon. We want to see legislation passed as swiftly as possible, but done in a responsible manner and one that, uh, of course, reflects the values of our country. So uh, we look forward to continuing to work with the Congress to do that. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Jason. My name is Jason Servanak, and I'm a legislative fellow for Congressman Bob Goodlatte. Um, as Kevin kind of alluded to the process uh, that we've gone through here, Chairman Thornberry uh, held a series of meetings with uh, all kinds of different groups, including civil liberties groups, companies that hold our critical infrastructure, as well as government entities. And out of that, we saw the recommendations that came out a few months ago. And each uh, person that was uh, represented from a committee, and I, actually, I worked for Mr. Goodlatte, who represented the Judiciary Committee on that, uh, was charged to go forward and form their own uh, piece of legislation, as you see, uh, Homeland Security and, uh, <coughs> and Jamil's committee, the uh, Intelligence Committee, came out with one. Uh, those, I think, is, I think that's how the process is going to work. I think each committee is going to be tasked with coming forward with uh, their own proposals. And as far as a guess goes on with Kevin, I don't know if they're going to package them together or do them individually. Um, as far as timing goes, well, we've already seen two committees introduce, and the uh, Intelligence Committee actually came out and marked theirs up. Uh, and going back again, I think one of the other charges, while it was a Republican task force, I think one of the things going forward was, you know, kind of try to work on a bipartisan basis. And as you saw, it came out of uh, Jamil's committee, I believe, 17 to 1? Chairman's committee, yeah. Yeah. Well, 17 sorry. to 1. Yeah, 17 to 1 on, on <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And uh, so 17 to 1 out of that. And I think that's kind of what we're looking forward going, you know, lo looking towards going forward. Um, if we can do things on a bipartisan basis, kind of knock out the easy uh, topics, I think that's... Uh, one way to go forward rather than come through with a large comprehensive bill where there's too much controversy and it just ends up stalling. I mean, after all, we're in an election year. We only have a few months before the end of Congress goes. Again, I think it's a heavy lift to get a large comprehensive bill through that has a lot of moving parts with a lot of different interest groups and different interests playing, playing their own role. Uh, so I think this process should be uh, beneficial going forward and hopefully we can at least get some of the stuff knocked out. Um, as far as content goes, um, 
you know, we've talked about Homeland Security and intelligence content. Uh, I think what we're looking at on Judiciary Committee is going to be a series of criminal proposals, uh, a lot of which was contained in the White House uh, proposal. Uh, for instance, folding uh, cyber attacks into a RICO uh, offense, as well as uh, shifting some of the minimums that you have on there and uh, adjusting the penalty structure within it. I think those were all good proposals that uh, deserve a good look, and I know that the task force looked at it. I know that going forward, the uh, committee will definitely look at those, and including some of those. Uh, so, I mean, I think that's one thing. On timing, I think that uh, in the next weeks and months, you'll see, uh, as intelligence has already marked theirs up, I imagine that that should go to the floor fairly soon. Homeland Security is talking about marking theirs up within the next few weeks, and I think you'll see all the committees kind of follow thereafter. And that hopefully, you know, sometime, I mean, I'm not going to put a deadline on it, but I mean, I imagine the next month, two months, three months, you'll start seeing these kind of roll out of each of the committees of jurisdiction and hopefully in a bipartisan fashion where they can be, uh, you know, both sides of the aisle can have it because it really is a bipartisan issue. And, uh, and, and I think that's where we're headed. Great. Thank you. Um, I know this d dialogue has been going on for quite some time. And when I first started uh, talking about this, working at VeriSign, my technology people like wanted to start a cyber auxiliary core and wanted to immediately start like designing uniforms. Um, and then my lawyers were like, whoa, what are we legally obligated for? Uh, and what computers are we talking about? Uh, so the, the, the dialogue seems to have come quite a long way, I think, from when we've had this conversation last year or even the, the years before. So one of the things, this is just an open question to you all, uh, from the, the perspective of the members and the senators, what are some of the challenges that you're running up against that there's either a, a lack of understanding of how the, the, the system works forward or anything that you're seeing is kind of the ultimate, you know, uh, hard stop that we're going to have to get around for this because we've really come a long way on information sharing. I think that um, the SEC rules, which said basically you needed to put risk and uh, any incidents in your 10K, all of a sudden companies got very interested in saying, I don't exactly know what that means. <laughs> so uh, you know we need some more guidance around that, and then there's an you know the possibility of an insurance market being created around this because of the risk capability. All of a sudden you have a lot more ears perked up and interested. People and I imagine over the um, you know the recess, knowing that uh, Senator Reid said this is coming to the floor, there have been a lot of people that have been in to talk to them. But I'm just kind of curious to hear what you what you guys are still kind of running up against is you know the things that that aren't really the immovable objects, or is everybody so cooperatively they can't wait to get get it out there on the floor? I, I can throw out a, a couple things. Um, I, I don't think that there are any immovable objects in what we're looking at. I think that uh, you know the. The trick is being able to have a dialogue with with all the appropriate stakeholders in which everybody can just sit can 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 sort of get on the same page in their understanding of the problem and have a sort of creative dialogue about what the solution might be and and I'll give a, a, a couple of examples um, the the two I think biggest challenges for us throughout the course of this debate have been, how do, what sort of framework do we establish for doing what Chris was talking about in terms of ensuring that uh, critical infrastructure um, are addressing the risks that they face in a way that uh, takes care of our, you know, core national security interests? And the second one is what do we do about the threat to the supply chain, All right? These are two issues that... Uh, we, we've had a lot of a lot of dialogue about with with all sorts of different stakeholders, but it's been very difficult to get everyone on the same page. And one of the biggest problems, something I'm, I'm sure Jamil deals with all the time in his job, is that you know we have a a threat. Um, the most compelling and um, most descriptive information about which is all classified and is not available to um, many of our industry interlocutors, and so. Um, you know, they understand that, I think by now, uh, many of our interlocutor, interlocutors understand that we're trying to address a threat that's real, but, but maybe don't, um, aren't able to engage with us in a dialogue about all the dimensions of that threat. On the other hand, um, you have a security community that, you know, <laughs> too often isn't sensitive enough to real business concerns about doing business in the real world and the, the um, complications that can arise when you have... Um, too heavy-handed involvement by the security community. Uh, so, you know, trying to get to a dialogue where everyone's sort of, um, you know, uh, agreeing to the same uh, assumptions about what the problem is and, and, and what the key dynamics are in achieving solutions has been really difficult. We are getting there, though. 
And I think, you know, over the, over the course of the last several weeks in particular, um, we've made a lot of progress on both of those fronts in, in terms of finally, you know, getting down to a dialogue where everyone involved is beginning to understand the, this, the highly targeted narrow set of infrastructure that we're uh, focusing on here, the, the infrastructure that, um, you know, the disruption of which would cause uh, major casualty events, you know, on, on, on par with sort of a, a destruction of a weapon, of, of a detonation of a weapon, weapon of mass destruction, um, <clears throat> major damage to the economy, not, not in a, you know, a company loses a few billion dollars here or there kind of way, but in a, you know, systemic way, you know, disruption of the U.S. economic system. And, and, and three, you know, serious harm to U.S. national security. And, and then, you know, understanding a dialogue based on not just understanding how, you know, that narrow targeting, but some of the ways that, you know, we want to further scope what would actually be fair game in terms of regulation or in terms of, you know, uh, government intervention. And I think we're getting there in a way that, that has made some inter industry interlocutors a lot more comfortable and has given, you know, the security community some of the tools that they think that they need. We're not there yet, but we're making progress. And I think the same thing is, is true in the supply chain. I'm, I'm actually hopeful that, um, you know, we're going to be able to get to a point where that's just no longer a controversy because we will have, you know, had this through this ongoing dialogue, um, we will have worked out a solution. But we're not there yet. I, I think we're... Um, making some progress, though, and, and uh, you know, I, I think it's just overcoming that, that fundamental difference of perspective that different stakeholders bring to the table that's been our, our biggest challenge so that we can have these, you know, conversations where everybody's, everybody's sort of talking about the same thing. I, I, would, I would, I wholeheartedly agree with 99% of what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the one thing that I, that I have a dis difference of opinion with you on time is that I don't think that any bill, even if it's on supply chain or anything, is going to, and I don't think you actually meant this either, so um, we'll stop the conversation, right? I don't think we're, I don't think, I think it would be um, inaccurate to say we, we get the Senate bill, we pass a House companion, we conference it, we, the President signs it, and we're done. Yeah. I mean, I, I just, I don't yeah. think anybody, uh, hopefully there are fewer and fewer people that think that, um, uh, passing a cyber bill will will finish th this issue. This, uh, I mean, this might as well be called the the congressional work pro program, right? I mean, because uh, there's always going to be another issue that we're going to have to address. Um, getting into my wholehearted agreement with you, though, and I think Chris mentioned this um, in his rundown. I think I think that really the three things that that we're kind of starting to all kind of coalesce around, and maybe I don't know, maybe I'm saying this because they're all in my bill, but um, it really critical infrastructure, protections, um, roles and responsibilities of, of government agencies and uh, as well as within the private sector, vis-a-vis -vis the private sector, and then infor information sharing. Um, I think those are the three issues that seem to get, and, and those are the th three that the administration, I believe, needs to need to be addressed. Those are the three that kind of seem to be always bubbling towards the top. Um, and now they're just because those are the ones that people talk about the most and kind of agree that those are the issues that, that need to be addressed, um, I don't think we have a, I, I don't think we have violent agreement yet on exactly what that looks like. Are we, are we close? Are we, at least we're, on in, we're all playing the same game at least now, right? Um, and that wasn't the case necessarily four or five years ago. Um, but we can, we can get there from here, I think. So are we going to do that this Congress? I sure hope so. Um, are we going to? I, I don't know. Any other comments on that? I think, uh, I think one of the things um, uh, that Chairman Rogers has tried to, uh, to talk about in the public debate about cybersecurity, I um, mean, you know, it's sort of unusual for an Intelligence Committee Chairman to, to be talking publicly about some of these things. Um, and, you know, we held an open hearing on cybersecurity. And one of the things I think he tried to outline um, was the fact that, you know, in, in the modern era, um, it's, it's not just critical infrastructures that are being targeted by our enemies. Um, it's the entire heart of our economy. It's the intellectual property that, that is the engine of the American economy. And, you know, the chairman uh, likes to talk about how, you know, there are two kinds of companies in, in America today. There are companies that have been hacked and know it, and there are companies that have been hacked and just don't know it yet. Um, and, and that's a real troubling situation, right? So, uh, you know, a lot of people are talking about um, um, the, the potential threat to, to large-scale industry. That's something we should... We should certainly be worried about, but we should also be worried about these sort of 
the, the, the taking of American intellectual property, the heart of our economy, on a day-in, day-out basis. And so that's part of why I think uh, the chairman and, and the ranking member's uh, bill um, tries to uh, provide um, government information, stuff that we know about, um, to a broad swath of the private sector to protect itself. Not by the government in the role of protecting the private sector, but simply provide the information that we already have that could be usefully used by the private sector to defend itself. I'm going to open uh, two questions on the floor. You have, get, get ready to get queued up out there. This is, or we've answered all the questions. I'd say while you guys are going to the microphone, um, one of the things I've noticed is that best practices were a real challenge. Uh, a couple of years ago, you can get anybody in the room, and I think you have much more cross-sector industry interest in, in best practices now because they're realizing that's probably the best way to go is to, to get, on the, get on the program. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, yeah question. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure which of the panelists or if, if all the panelists want to respond to this, but uh, I, I get, just in, in the interest of disclosure, I'll tell you my my background and my interest. I, I'm policy advisor to the chairman of the DC Public Service Commission, and of course we regulate PEPCO, and PEPCO's in the process of uh, completing the installation of uh, advanced metering in infrastructure, which is the first step for deployment of the smart grid here in, in DC. Uh, and we are very consciously aware about the security risks to that system and the potential ramifications, not only to the ratepayers, but frankly, the federal government, uh, as well as to others. But we don't uh, obviously have the tools to be able to address cybersecurity. So we, like most state regulators, uh, in, in fact, have, shall we say, the expectation that Congress, the federal government, will be able to provide that type of security. My question now is, as that as background is, it seems to me, just my personal opinion, not that necessarily of the commission, but it seems to me that one of the, shall we say, the pregnant questions out there is, how do we prevent foreign cyber security attacks? Uh, we keep hearing the anecdotal stories about attacks that, that have uh, germinated in, uh, in China or in, in the, the fo former uh, Soviet bloc countries, that, uh, many of which have very poor diplomatic relations with the United States. To what extent can we assure ourselves, assure uh, our constituency, whether it be ratepayers or, or, or uh, the electorate that, uh, that you serve, uh, to what extent can we provide them the, the comfort level that we have taken the steps through legislation that you're working on or through other means to be able to ensure that we have that type of, shall we say, national security protection? Can I ask for a, a, you to refine your question? Because I'm thinking it through, and I'm not quite sure that being more attached to the grid is more of a threat. I'm, I'm a little unclear on all right, what you're well, concerned All right, about. maybe I can be a bit more specific then. Uh, are, there, are there legislative proposals that would provide new authorities to, whether it be DHS or to other uh, governmental agencies that would enable them to either uh, uh, I, I wouldn't say prosecute, but be, to be able to go after, maybe use the vernacular, uh, uh, whether it be hackers in Sweden or, or hackers in China that have uh, gone after the critical infrastructure. And I'm not talking about you know, uh, you know going after the credit cards, which is kind of, I kind of see as a kind of a, a different type of issue, but those that have had malicious intent. Uh, to go after critical infrastructure. Is, are there legislative uh, proposals that you're working on that are going to specifically address that issue? Can I get, sorry, did, so knowing a little bit about this, uh, is your concern that you have, you need to know more about the attack, you don't know what to do when you're attacked, or you have information on the attack and you're not sure who to share it with? No, uh, you want no, a remedy I, from the attack? I, no, I, I guess I'm talking about preventative measures before an right, attack okay. occurs. Are there ways right, okay. in which uh, are, are there uh, legislative remedies that are under consideration that are speci specifically targeted to preventing, uh, rather than going and prosecuting? I'm talking about prevention of a, 
of an attack on critical infrastructures such as uh, the electric grid. So the, the kind of the warning sign that says you do this, here's the consequences. So they, they know ahead of time they're, they're well, going to get in trouble. That may be one way. Okay. Uh, I, I can speculate about other ways, but I'm interested in hearing what the experts have to say about uh, the, the proposals that uh, they're working on and that they're uh, promoting. If I can um, start out, I, I'm sure some other folks may have a lot to add, but a, a lot of what we're doing is aimed specifically at that. I think, you know, first of all, I think what we're trying to set up with the critical infrastructure regulatory regime is um, to put a system in place that guarantees that critical infrastructure uh, entities, again, in this in this narrow category of, of entities that, you know, have a, a have a sort of, you know, an, an impact on significant numbers of lives or, you know, U.S. national security, that kind of thing. Um, are complying, are, are, are achieving a level of security that is sufficient to sort of, um, and, and let me be, be candid here, because I, I think this is a really important question, achieve a level of security that's necessary to sort of raise the bar um, so that your sort of average cyber, malicious cyber actors are um, unable or at least less able to target those systems. Um, and I'll come back to that. But that's, that's one piece. The second piece is uh, the administration sent up something that I think is, is very helpful and very important, which is an authority to allow DHS to provide specific technology and technical assistance to the private sector on a voluntary by request basis. So that, um, you know, that, that allows the, uh, you know, the, the electric utility or the nuclear power plant uh, owner or whatever to sit down with DHS's technical experts or NSA's technical experts and um, develop uh, technological approaches and technical approaches that are best to defend their system. And I think that's really, really important. Um, there are, you know, we, we do include some criminal penalties to help us go after hackers and others that, that uh, target uh, critical infrastructure. And, and the information sharing is probably one of the biggest preventive measures because if you can see the threat coming, you can take steps to act to, to prevent it. And hopefully the information sharing regime that we're all trying to put in place will, will help us see the threat coming better. Um, but I want to come back to what I said earlier. I think really philosophically here, you know, the best we're going to be able to do is put in place a system that, that sort of raises the price of admission for this, this uh, cyber battle that is underway between a number of different actors so that the less sophisticated actors are no longer able to play and, that, and so that there is greater cost for the more, sophistic more sophisticated actors because there's simply not going to be a technological solution that stops the most sophisticated foreign actors from uh, successfully carrying out cyber attacks if they choose to do so. I think the solution there is going to be more uh, one that relies on diplomacy, on deterrence, on intelligence, and on other sorts of, uh, you know, national policies that help us engage with foreign adver adversaries that might wish to, uh, you know, carry out cyber attacks on that level. But the, the vast majority of um, cyber activity is not, you know, sophisticated state actors. It is the, the hackers and, uh, you know, other cyber criminals that I think, you know, if we're able to put in place this sort of baseline security, it's going to make their life a lot more difficult. And that's our goal. Let me just uh, add a couple things. I, I wholeheartedly agree with Tommy uh, on that, and uh, I just wanted to point out a couple things uh, from the administration's viewpoint. Uh, first, uh, indeed, we, we need new authorities to be able to work more proactively with the private sector. Uh, we're doing a lot under existing authorities. In fact, uh, it's uh, ironic that you bring up the grid because just last week we started the uh, electric sector uh, grid um, modeling project, which is essentially to map out some of these vulnerabilities and have a more systemic approach to addressing them uh, in partnership with, uh, with uh, electric sector stakeholders. But um, a, a couple key things for us here. First, you know, the approach that we take in cybersecurity is not unlike the one we take uh, in counterterrorism, which is that it takes a whole of government, uh, cross-government cross approach, uh, working with communities, um, state and local municipalities to not only educate uh, and inform, but also harden and prevent. And um, you'll see a lot of what we propose in our, in our uh, legislative proposal is to do just that. It's to uh, enable 
executive branch departments to better work together, much of, what is, much of which is done through the Department of Homeland Security, which has uh, in its purview, of course, uh, domestic peacetime cybersecurity for the United States. Uh, so what we've tried to do is give the Secretary of DHS new authorities to be able to engage uh, with local stakeholders and community stakeholders, uh, like the, the DP, DC Public Service Commission would be an example of that. Um, and, and to do so in two ways. First, to help you harden your infrastructure uh, by educating you more about the threat and some best practices that you could institute uh, on a voluntary basis, of course. Uh, and the second is uh, we think it's really essential that DHS serve as an aggregation point for, for information about the threat, um, not only information that the private sector shares with the government about risks, because, for example, there could be an, a municipality in California that has faced a very similar threat that you're facing tomorrow. Uh, maybe they, they saw it last week. So we want the Secretary of DHS to be able to aggregate and then share that information quickly, uh, not only within the sector, but also across sectors and voluntarily uh, with whomever else uh, would benefit. Um, and then, as I mentioned, also an aggregation point for government technical assistance, uh, as Tommy mentioned. We think that's really important. Um, but just going back to your original question, which is about nation states' threats, it's important to, to uh, recognize, as Tommy pointed out, we want to raise the cost of admission, and you do that by better cyber hygiene, hardening your infrastructure. Some of the higher end nation state threats, there's other ways that we can address those. We can address it, for example, through deterrence. Um, and that's part of what uh, some of our other provisions would do, such as um, a new prosecu prosecutu prosecutorial tools, excuse me, um, to be able to go out and find and investigate uh, some of the bad guys out there that, are, that want to attack us. So again, I think you have to layer it all together. You can't just look at this in a vacuum or look at any one aspect of the problem. Great, thank you. Shane, do you have time for another question? Sure. Steve DelBianco with NetChoice, and this is a quick question about the content of your respective drafts. And it would be this, if, uh, if the DHS designates a particular facility or infrastructure group as critical, and that would carry with it certain obligations and expenditures, what uh, can a company or a, even a locality do if they've been designated but they feel as if it might be impossible or incredibly expensive for them to comply with the obligations of being designated as critical. And I, I'll let you each answer th to think about ways that companies that are very patriotic and very concerned about our casualties and infrastructure and economics, but they may be operating a, an ancient legacy infrastructure for which the kind of hardening or monitoring that you're asking for just can't be done. Thank you. I'll start with what we proposed, and then we'll defer to my uh, co-panelists. What we proposed was uh, a notice and comment rulemaking framework uh, to be able to judge that criteria so that companies would have a say in what that criteria would be. So for example, you may say, well, uh, it, it would require this type of system. Um, uh, and you know, a legacy system, I would assume, would not be included in that criteria as you go through the APA process. Uh, but there are administrative um, protocols, of course, to uh, uh, um, if you have a problem with the APA process. So, so that's pretty standard there. Uh, the second thing that we would do, of course, is uh, by sector, uh, we would offer the ability uh, for, for entities to opt to be basically uh, by administration procedures uh, deemed compliant and not have to uh, comply with the framework. Uh, they would have to make a, a series of uh, procedural requirements to do that. As we, have, we have a similar provision in our bill. We also have a, um, for those companies that believe that they were inaccurately classified as, as critical infrastructure, we have a, we have a uh, uh, provision in our bill, which I think the Senate also has, um, with regard to uh, just challenging that, that designation. Uh, no, it's, well, it's actually uh, the federal court, and I think D.C. is the, uh, the jurisdiction. Um, and I, I'd, I'd mention a couple things in the Senate bill. I mean, first of all, I think what we're trying to accomplish here is a, is a, a narrow enough set of criteria for being designated as a, as a um, critical infrastructure that the, um, the, the types of entities that this applies to are um, pretty li limited in number and, and probably fairly large in size for the most part. Um, I, and I think, I think that's, that, and most of them are, are already regulated and already having to comply with some, um, some set of standards here. So I think that's, that's one part of it, um, but we do include some language 
you know, specifically uh, requiring the, the Department of Homeland Security in developing these regulations to take cost into account so that the regulations that are issued are not, um, you know, cost prohibitive. And then the other thing I think that's, that's really important to our approach is that, you know, the, the and I should say, I mean, our, our legislation includes a number of the things that Chris and Kevin both mentioned. Um, so those, you can take those and apply them too. But um, another thing that I think is important to mention is that, you know, the whole philosophy behind doing this is that, um, you know, what we should be mandating here are not, you know, specific ways, specific technologies that you have to buy or specific ways of doing things. We're not going to tell you to go out and buy, you know, super server version 8.0 because that's the latest and greatest and you got to have it in your system. Um, the, the approach is that it's outcomes based and that you have to achieve a certain level of security, but how you do that, um, you know, is something that you work out as a private sector entity on the basis of what's best for your company and what's the best, you know, what, what's the way that makes the most sense for achieving that level of security. Thankfully, our legislation doesn't <coughs> have to address these issues. Um, you know, where we provide, uh, uh, the chairman's legislation um, would provide information out to the private sector, I mean, giving clear authority to defend their own networks. So um, I think we're a little lucky in that we don't have to, uh, have to cross that bridge. Another question? Hi, I'm Nilmini Rubin from the Information Technology Industry Council. Um, thank you all for, for being here today. Um, it seems to be that there's kind of a difference in style with the House going more towards um, issues that people have agreed on. And, and Tommy, you're talking about um, going to the Senate floor and kind of hashing things out on the floor, kind of old school. Um, and, and I was, some have raised the concern that, that this, the hashing it out on the floor would, could lead to over-politization of, of cybersecurity issues and, and things coming down on party lines rather than the substance of the cybersecurity issue. And I was wondering, um, if you could speak to that. Sure. I, I was probably a little imprecise in my um, wording of, of how we're going about this. I think what comes to the floor will reflect, by and large, um, wide agreement. And in fact, I mean, we're addressing, as, as Kevin sort of mentioned, we're addressing the same, you know, core issues here. It's, it, there are disagreements um, over, you know, specific wording in certain areas. And those are things that, that we will need, I mean, as we do on, on any number of bills. And, and a good example, I think the, the process that we talk about when we're looking at, at, you know, the process for this legislation is that it's somewhat akin to a Defense Authorization Act where we come through. And as you know, I mean, on this Defense Authorization Act, there are three or 400 amendments every year. And we work through those and we accept ones that we think will make the bill better. Um, we reject ones that look like they're, you know, going to make the bill worse. And then, you know, there's a pretty big number of amendments that uh, we engage in a real, you know, a serious debate on. And we, you know, we, we vote on amendments, we modify the amendments, we second degree the amendments, and we have a debate, you know, that ultimately helps get the bill um, in as good a shape as possible. And that's how the Senate should work. And that's how the Senate works best when it, when it is working. Um, it, it's not to say that, you know, we're going to, you know, bring something up that's just completely, um, you know, sort of random and, and let things go where they go. I mean, I think what we bring up will be our best effort at achieving a consensus position. But as you know, um, having worked in the Senate, you never, almost never, you know, get 100 senators to agree on, to agree on, on anything of, of real substance. And, and there needs to be a debate so that you can, um, you, you can really... Uh, move, move forward with something that has, you know, the, the biggest uh, coalition of support in the Senate as possible. I think politiz politization, politicization is going to be a problem no matter how we do this. It's going to be a risk. I shouldn't say it's going to be a problem. It's something we're very, uh, trying very hard to avoid, and we've, we've you know, we, I, I think we've gone out of our way to put in place a, a process that allows for the greatest possible bipartisan um, dialogue and participation um, and, and cooperation in developing um, the legislation. Uh, we are, um, you know, for Senator Reid's part, you know, we've, we've, this is exactly why we've tried to stay out of the drafting and leave it to the committees. Um, and, uh, you know, ultimately when it comes to the floor, I think we're, we're going to do everything possible to ensure that we do have a substantive debate and, uh, you know, we, we, I can speak for one of a uh, hundred senators here, um, so some of that is out of our control, but it's certainly our hope to, to avoid that, and we're going to be doing everything possible to maintain that, that bipartisan approach here. Thank you. 
This will be our last question. Hi. Uh, oh, that's working. Uh, this is a question for Mr. Finan. Um, quick prefatory question. Is Congress's infrastructure and the judiciary's infrastructure classified as critical infrastructure under the bill? Um, not, uh, let me think, that the criteria hasn't been set. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's a scenario where it could be included in that criteria. Um, I don't believe so. I, I think constitutionally it would be. Well, government services is, a, is one of the 18 uh, critical infrastructure sectors. So, so but, but, but I think constitutionally the executive branch would not be able to designate the congressional and judiciary branches as, as something that the executive branch would then regulate. Right. That was my question. Thank you. All right. Uh, well, let's thank our panelists, please. <laughs> and if you can retire to the area out here for your networking reception. And remember, there's more tomorrow. Thanks.